Hi, I'm Calivan. Let's have a little chat about Jagged Alliance. This series took a lot of cues from what then was pop culture, so before we continue I think we need to establish a little bit of context. Sometime around the 1980s a new genre of film began to emerge. Built on the concepts that were established in the spy thrillers, westerns and disaster films of the 60s and 70s, we started to see pictures that would incorporate a lone man or an unlikely team taking on wave after wave of baddies in what was then a modern setting. Films such as First Blood, Lone Wolf McQuaid and Commando solidified the genre and will be the template for many future action releases. This run will continue well on into the mid 90s with films like Predator, Under Siege and also the sequels like Die Hard with a Vengeance. Towards the end of the decade, theatre going audiences would start to tire of this formula and wanted something a bit different. This saw the rise of action films with a grittier and more realistic edge such as Heat or Leon, or perhaps more complex sci-fi elements like The Matrix. However before this happened, a small development company called Mad Lab Software took a lot of these 80s action film concepts and wrapped them all up in a game that they called Jagged Alliance. Arriving in 1995 for MS DOS and published by Surtec, Jagged Alliance puts you in control of a team of catchphrase spewing mercenaries on the fictional island of Metavira. The island is in a bit of a state you see, its former status as a nuclear testing site has caused some of the trees on the island to mutate and produce a kind of sap that has a whole variety of medical uses. You'd think this would be a good thing, but an evil researcher has hired a whole bunch of goons and has taken the island by force with the aim of making huge profits from the sale of this new miracle resource. Your team has been hired by the island's natives to retake control and expel the current invaders. As you capture more territory, you gain access to more of this medical goo which you can turn into hard currency and use to hire more mercenaries and get better equipment. It's very much a game of two halves, with part of the game taking place on a strategic map where you organise your general campaign, and the other part taking place on a tactical turn-based layer where you directly engage the enemy forces. Considering that the fictional island setting, your team of rough and ready mercenaries and a villain with an almost limitless supply of henchmen, the story concept straight out of an 80s action film, the game has a surprising amount of depth. Competency within the tactical turn-based missions is not enough to secure victory, you must also become adept at managing the overall campaign. This isn't limited to just moving your team from tile to tile, but hiring new mercenaries, equipping them and recruiting militia or workers to defend your hard-fought gains and harvest the sap found in those areas. After a successful release, Mad Lab was absorbed into Surtec and produced a standalone expansion called Deadly Games the following year. Unlike its predecessor, it consisted of a set of chronological missions rather than an open campaign, but it did innovate a little, adding things like mortars, weapon mods and new mission types to the tactical turn-based game. Despite being seen as a spin-off by many, it was again a success and would put Surtec in a position to release what might be one of the greatest turn-based tactical games ever. Originally released in 1999, Jagged Alliance 2 took everything that was good about Jagged Alliance and Deadly Games and just made it better. It's set in the fictional island nation of Orolco, a place administered by a ruthless queen who rules with an iron fist. Deidreanna has bled the country dry and sits in her opulent palace surrounded by her royal guard while her citizens live a life of abject poverty. It's a brutal existence, but there's one glimmer of hope. A small but determined resistance group is set on freeing the country from Deidreanna's oppression. Funded by the legitimate leader living in exile, you and your team have been contacted to link up with the rebels and free the country by forcing a regime change. The overall game plays out a little like the first game, but every single aspect is richer, more detailed and better executed. From a purely technical point of view, the graphics are greatly improved, as are the sounds, voices, music and control scheme. It's 25 years old now, so it still looks dated, but it's quite easy to understand what everything is and it's still very playable today. The tactical gameplay is a vast improvement over the previous and incorporates the additions from Deadly Games as well as a whole host of new concepts like night vision, stealth and many more weapon types and modules. It's a lot easier to use and appreciate cover and stances and you really feel like you have a huge amount of options available to you during every situation. It uses the same sort of action point system again but it's more detailed and presents you with a lot more agency. Just like the tactical side, the strategic layer brings a whole new host of considerations. 
The nation of Orolco is chock full of settlements and places of interest, all of which are worth visiting. You can move teams of mercenaries around the map on foot, but if you've taken out enough SAM sites, you can engage the services of a local pilot to fly you quickly from place to place. Instead of harvesting magical sap from mutated trees, some of the towns contain mines which if captured bring in additional funds that you can use for more mercenaries, militia and equipment, and bribes. Yes, bribes. You see, Jagged Alliance 2 is also partly a role-playing game, and you get to meet a lot of the inhabitants of Orolco. They all have different problems and stories, as well as needs and motivations. Some are more receptive to your calls than others, and some are just there to make an easy buck for themselves. You can convince, threaten, bribe or assist the various folks you meet and every interaction has a real impact on the game world. Slip the shifty looking guy at the airport a few dollars and he'll guarantee that none of your incoming supplies go missing. Shoot him in the face and he won't be able to steal them in the first place. However, your actions have consequences and there are positives and negatives to many of the possible solutions to your problems. To aid the role playing aspect of the game, you can explore each place of the world in real time running around, interacting with things and speaking to the people you meet. When enemies are near and combat starts, it kicks into turn-based mode, but outside of that you're free to explore to your heart's content. I think the role-playing elements are what transforms Jagged Alliance 2 from a good game to an amazing one. They provide additional gameplay elements, but also serve to really flesh out the nation of Orolco and make it feel like a real place, instead of just a generic backdrop to your daily murdering. What really seals the deal is that you get to play as yourself if you want. In fact, the very first thing you do in the game is to generate your own character, answering a series of profiling questions that determine your skills and abilities. No longer are you a faceless commander or a pre-generated mercenary, instead you're one of the characters in the story. One of the aspects that really sets Jagged Alliance 2 apart from many other entries in the genre, both old and new, is the rich level of detail that's present in every little facet of the game. It would take hours to explain it all, so instead let's just look at how you build your team as one small example. In something like XCOM 2, you're given a few pre-generated soldiers to start with, and when you want more you click on the recruitment screen, you click buy, and hey presto you've got a new soldier. In Jagged Alliance 2 you get an email on your in-game laptop, which invites you to take the personality test we mentioned earlier, and then generates your character. You then visit the website for AIM, the Association of International Mercenaries and browse their catalogue. There are 40 different characters available, all with their own portraits, personalities, voice lines and skills. You can only afford the cheaper ones at the start of the game, but after you earn some more funds, the better ones become available. Shortly after the start, you get another email from a new startup company called Merck, or the More Economical Recruitment Agency. This new agency is a bit rough around the edges, but does give you access to a few more mercenaries. They're a bit on the weak side, but they do improve very quickly without influencing their cost too much so they can be very useful. If you make use of Merc services, the company will actually grow and they will expand their portfolio, while if you ignore them, they'll actually run into financial trouble and be forced to close their business. On top of this, there are another 10 or so NPCs that you can meet within the game world that you can also recruit, increasing the number of usable characters to over 60. These soldiers of fortune don't operate in a vacuum, some are friends with each other, and some are rivals, and there are various performance and morale consequences of teaming them up together. This rich depth is present in many of the game systems, which when pulled together with everything else made it a really unique and special experience. Well she better say her prayers Miguel, cause she's got another thing coming, like a bullet to the head. Good to be on board with you. Just like all the previous games, Jagged Alliance 2 was a success, receiving positive reviews, award nominations and decent sales figures. However, there was trouble in paradise. The publishing side of Surtec had run into financial difficulties and was forced to shut down before the release of Jagged Alliance 2. They stated various reasons, including problems with the retail market and obstacles with the growing industry, but I think that's just corporate speak. If you look at the last 5 games they published, they were all met with negative reviews and poor sales, so my assumption is just that they were pushed over the edge by that particular string of failures. The developer side of Surtec, Surtec Canada, was still going and Jagged Alliance 2 was published by Talonsoft. Despite a solid reception, it looks like Surtec Canada ran into their own financial problems shortly after. They released a standalone expansion to Jagged Alliance 2 called Unfinished Business, which was sort of in the same vein as Deadly Games. 
Rather than a dynamic campaign with RPG elements, it consisted of a series of missions with a linear plot. Many thought it felt like a rush job by a desperate developer short of cash and it wasn't well received. Not long after, Surtec Canada would wind up operations and that appeared to be the end of the Jagged Alliance series at the time. But not quite. Strategy First had acquired the rights and put out a gold edition in 2002. This was an improved version of the base game featuring some of the changes introduced in Deadly Games. Later still, in 2004, Ideal Games was licensed to release an official expansion to Jagged Alliance 2 called Wildfire. This was a proper expansion rather than a spin-off like Deadly Games and did improve the base game. Most interestingly it included the source code in the package under a non-commercial use license, allowing modders to create their own versions of the game. Unfortunately, despite these additional releases, the golden age of Jagged Alliance came to an end once Surtec went out of business, and the original creative minds and talents were no longer involved. But Jagged Alliance never truly died. It had gained a very devoted fan base, was fondly remembered by many, and various attempts were made to revive it over the years. The problem was it seemed to have developed some sort of curse around it, and every time someone tried to create a new Jagged Alliance game, something went horribly wrong. Strategy First and Game Factory Interactive would attempt to produce the next two games in the series, a 3D remake of Jagged Alliance 2 and a sequel called Jagged Alliance 3. Strategy First would provide the license and the direction, while GFI would provide the funding and Mistland South would do the development. It turns out that this complex relationship of mismatched goals would be a whole Jagged Alliance in itself, and it wasn't long before it ran into problems. Strategy First wanted an amazing fully featured game to reboot the series, GFI wanted to spend as little money as possible, and Mistland South wanted to ditch the turn based play and evolving campaign and instead have real time missions with a linear story. GFI lost the rights to Jagged Alliance 3 over this dispute, and then announced that the developer was being dissolved. This caused Strategy First to lose all confidence in GFI and withdraw any rights to the Jagged Alliance series. Game Factory would actually continue on to release the game with all of the references to Jagged Alliance removed under the name Hired Guns, the Jagged Edge, but this was met with a lacklustre reception and really mediocre reviews. Strategy First made another attempt to produce Jagged Alliance 3 a few years later, but after entering into an agreement with another Russian developer, it went through a series of problems and delays before being quietly dropped and the license sold to a company called Bit Composer in 2010. Now it was Bit Composer's turn. In 2012 they released Jagged Alliance back in action, a full remake of Jagged Alliance 2 using modern technology and a pausable real time tactical model. Back in action was an interesting release and up until last year it was probably the closest anyone got to actually making another good game in the series. Unfortunately it missed the mark and it can probably be described as sort of okay. The difficulty with this series is that the 1999 release set such a high bar that even an average game would be regarded as an abject failure. The reviews were not terrible, but it was not of the calibre required to properly reboot the series and it didn't receive anything close to universal acclaim. I've actually played quite a bit of it myself and I don't think it's a bad game, but whenever I've got the urge to play some Jagged Alliance, I always found myself loading up the gold pack instead of back in action. But Big Composer was not quite done yet. They licensed out the game to Cliffhanger Productions who made a couple of online only browser games which predictably didn't make much of an impact. Then it went to Full Control, a Danish developer who got the project up and running after a successful Kickstarter campaign. They would release the wildly unpopular Jagged Alliance Flashback in 2014, a mediocre game plagued with problems and unfavourable reviews. True to form, the developer went under shortly after release, yet another casualty in the quest to revive the series. And so the curse continued, and Bit Composer themselves ran into serious financial difficulties in 2015. They did manage to stay afloat due to some restructuring, which is a business code word for mass layoffs, but they were forced to sell the IP to THQ Nordic as part of an effort to raise some cash. You would think at this point that every developer in the known world would have avoided the Jagged Alliance license like the plague, but it wasn't quite done claiming scalps yet. Cliffhanger Productions, who had made the Jagged Alliance online series, had a stab at a proper sequel, releasing Jagged Alliance Rage in 2018. It was of a far smaller scope than anyone was hoping or expecting from a Jagged Alliance game, 
and it was met with poor sales and negative reviews. The only expectations that it did meet was that Cliffhanger Productions would declare bankruptcy shortly after release. And then something strange happened. In 2021, THQ announced Jagged Alliance 3 was under development by Hemimont Games, and in 2023 they released a great Jagged Alliance game. Honestly, this surprised just about everyone, as after 20 years of failure someone had actually done what we all thought was impossible. It was met with 90% positive reviews, sold over 300,000 copies on release, and 8 months on has still got thousands of people playing it on Steam. I'm going to take a full look at Jagged Alliance 3 in a future video and make an attempt to break down why it succeeded where so many others failed, so look out for that video in the future. In the meantime, go and play it, it's normally available for under 30 bucks on Steam and if you can't afford that, Jagged Alliance 2 is under a fiver, so go and play that instead. Hi, I'm Canivan. I hope you enjoyed this look back at the Jagged Alliance series and all of the unlucky developers and publishers it has consumed over the years. If you've played any of those games, let me know what you thought of them in a comment. As usual, if you enjoyed this video, click the like button, and if you want more of this sort of thing, then subscribe to my channel, and I hope to see you back soon.